Mm -hmm. Because employees have to feel that they're a part of the whole scheme of things. They have to feel, as I mentioned, that their input and their presence means something to the business. I don't want to just be, you know, number CJ 236A <laughs> hmm. that comes and sits in seat 15. Yeah, I want to be, I want to be somebody that you're looking at as a leader. Look at me and see where you can help me grow. You're listening to the Focus on Customer Experience podcast. podcast. Benjamin Del Grosso gives you the ins and outs of one of the most underlooked aspects in business today. Improve your customer service and watch your business skyrocket. Two, one. Hello and welcome to the show. Today we have Beverly. Beverly is a customer satisfaction leader, certified project manager and HR professional with 25 years of experience developing high performing teams. Now owner and managing director of strategic HR consultants, Beverly works to help clients improve productivity and build a stronger, more collaborative workforce with creating a customer first culture. Now, I'm really looking forward to this interview because a lot of the stuff I learned early on was all about customer first, right? Which was friendly, immediate, recognize, say hi, and thanks. At least that was the acronym I was taught many years ago. <laughs> so, Beverly, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. So, um, why don't you tell us a little bit about your story? Uh, I know we kind of talked off camera about it, but tell us how you got to running an HR consulting company? Well, I've been in customer service for my entire working career, pretty much. I started out uh, years ago out of high school as a bank teller, and that kind of set me on that journey that helped me uh, establish my soft skills and build the customer first mentality. And um, had a couple of stops along the way, spent the last 25 years of my career at at and where I started out as a customer service representative in the major account center. So we were handling, uh, managing all large business accounts, hospitals, um, uh, TV stations, radio stations, television stations, just all the major banks, th those type of things. So in those arenas, the customer service is has to be top notch. It just has to be first rate. I started out there as a customer service representative, and then I moved on to a customer service manager and uh, received my uh, project management certification from PMI. And I started to uh, work on as a SME on the customer satisfaction initiatives. Moved on to business process outsourcing, where I was actually lead of the team that hired out a contractor to manage some of our customer service uh, processes, wrote and delivered customer service training, customer satisfaction, quality control, all that kind of thing. And I moved on to human resources, where I worked on the team that actually negotiates the working agreement. So if you're not familiar with union offices, that probably doesn't mean a lot, but AT&T is a union shop. And so the majority of their employees are covered under a working agreement that's negotiated with the union every three to four years. So my team did that and I managed grievances. I managed the grievance process at the, the fourth level. I retired from AT&T at that level and always having wanted to have my own business, I decided, well, now's a good time. And with my customer satisfaction background, my customer service training and my HR training, I started my HR consultancy. That's awesome because, you know, nowadays I feel like with automation coming in, you know, you go to a lot of these places and I don't know how it is down there, but here they still have like these plexiglass dividers between us and like the tills and you can't even like hear people or have a conversation with anybody anymore. 
you know, it's really not personable and customer service just seems to me like it just keeps going down and down and nobody's doing anything to create a difference. And, you know, um, I'm just kind of curious, you know, what methods do you use to improve employee engagement, employee engagement so that they can give good customer service? Well, one of the most important things you want to do when you're considering uh, improving your employee engagement is make sure that your employees understand that you care as a leader and that they are important to the business and make sure that they understand where they fit in. We don't want our employees to think they're just another cog in the whole groove of things. We, We want them to understand how important their position is, and how they impact the business. Once people are working on a job, you spend a lot of time at work. I think I calculated something like 81,000 hours or something crazy like that, that we spend um, on our jobs. And when you're spending that much of your lifetime on a job, it needs to be as comfortable and enjoyable as possible. And leaders have a big, a big part in that. Leaders have a big opportunity to ensure that their employees are happy, they're supported, they feel valued. All those things are important. The training, you want to make sure that they're empowered, that they're able to do their jobs to a satisfactory level, not just for the leader, but for them as well. Nobody wants to work at a job where they're not doing their best or where they struggle to perform. So as a leader, those are some of the things you want to make sure that are happening for your employees. Yeah, definitely. I will agree because if you do take care of your staff, your staff are going to take care of your customers. Customers. Right. And and a a lot of companies always say that they, you know, I don't want to invest in training because, you know, what if they quit on me and go work somewhere else? It's like, okay, but what if they continue giving bad customer service to your current customers and you don't train them? You know what I mean? Like, Mm -hmm. you know, so many people aren't Mm -hmm. thinking long-term. They're just, they're thinking short-term. Like it's going to cost me, you know, $500 for this training now. What if they quit on me in three months? Okay, well, then they've left your company better trained. And that should still speak volumes to you that, hey, you were willing to train people and Mm -hmm. they might refer a friend, a family member, you know, they might have a sister, brother, or somebody who is looking for that job. I mean, do you think, you know, you look at like these big companies, you know, let's use Best Buy as an example, huge company. They bring people in, they train them, they invest in them. They have no choice. That that is that is their process. They hire people who are seasonal, and they need to train them within a week or two to help with the busy season, and then they let them go. You know, usually early January, right? That's mm-hmm. just the name of the game in that industry. Mm-hmm. There's no hard feelings like, oh, well, you know. But if you don't properly train these people, what kind of service are you going to get? You know, from from like, what is your customers going to get? They're not going to get that good of service at all, especially if they're not properly trained. Yeah, you're exactly right. And uh, first, if employee churn is a big issue at your company, that's something you need to be looking at. You need to be more concerned about that than you actually are about the money that you're spending on training. Why are employees leaving? And if you've not properly trained your employees, as I mentioned earlier, that they're not going to do a good job and they're not going to be happy there. They will always be struggling. There'll always be a challenge and they'll never get to where they can call themselves a SME, which is a subject matter expert. Everybody wants to do a good job. I believe that's my, that's my thought. Uh, Uh, and I'm sticking to it, (laughs) on most employees. I believe that employees all want to do a good job and rewarding them doesn't have to be major rewards, doesn't have to be huge salary increases or anything. You know, uh, anything from a simple 
uh, thank you in a meeting. I want, hey guys, I want to let you know what Bev did today. You know, I saw her with the customer. You know, anything from that to the parking space to a breakfast to a plaque on the wall, you know, anything to reward your employees is encouraging. So we want to make sure that we take care of those employees and help them understand how important they are, but you got to prepare them for the job that you want them to do. Yeah, it's very important to invest in training for all of your staff. Mm -hmm. If you're if you're not investing in training, like we already said earlier, what are you what are your customers going to get on on the other end? They're not going to get right. a good experience. And the big thing nowadays is <clears throat> people can just order stuff off Amazon. So if that's the kind of service you're going to give in your store, you're now competing with Amazon. But mm -hmm. if you're going to give different experience where you actually take care of people, you educate the customer, you take care of them, you can let them know that they can come back to you and you will take care of them. All those things are a big thing when it comes to customer service and your employees being empowered to know that they can take care of that client and that client will keep coming back. And exactly. that's very important. Exactly. And when your employees are empowered and they get a, you know, let's say they get a call and the customer is not happy with the product and wants to return it. And then they've got to be transferred three or four times just to get a label or something to, you know, make that transfer or if they want a refund or something like that. And your employees are just not empowered to make that call or to make that decision. And they've got all these restrictions that they have to um, consult or fall within before they can make a decision. You hired them. Hopefully you vetted them. You trained them. So let them do their job. Let them do what you've hired them to do. And most employees prefer not to have to consult someone else every time they want to take a step in their job they don't want the mother may i type mentality to offer a refund or offer a partial credit to a customer train them properly let them do their job yeah this is very true i've actually talked about this quite a bit on the podcast where and for some people who listen all the time this might sound like a broken record but you know, I always talk about when I worked at Best Buy many years ago, and you'd have to go to this one manager, and the one manager would always like do this, 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 and that, right? And then do this, mm -hmm. this, this, and that. And they give you the answer every single time. Then I remember we got this new manager, and I remember going up to him, and I go, Hey, uh, yeah, so uh, there's this such and such challenge in the department. Um, and he goes, Okay, well, what's the solution? I don't know. I came to you. And they're like, they're like, come back to me when you have two options. And I was like, okay, this was confusing. And I remember I went back to the department and I was like, they didn't give me the answer. What the heck's going on here? Right. Because that's just that, that was the environment the other manager was building or the culture that manager was building within the store. This new manager, I went back and I said, well, these are the two options I think that'll work. He goes, which one do you think is the better one? And I go, well, this one. He goes, okay, do it. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Mm -hmm. And then what happened was I kept going back a couple times after that. And he's like, yeah, you're smart enough to know what, what decisions to make. Just make them. But if it costs money, come and see me first. Right? It's like, okay. And then that was like a manager empowering me. But if that didn't happen yes. and everybody continuously held my hand, you know, I wouldn't be further along like I am today. Exactly. That was my next point. If you want your employees to grow and to move along in the company or the organization, let them strengthen that muscle. You know, they may make some mistakes occasionally, but probably won't make the same mistake twice. And there's always learning in mistakes. I, I like to say, I, I never lose. I either win or I learn. So there's always learning in your mistakes. And that's what helps them grow and actually prepares them for the next step. I like to try to have employees, if they do leave me and go somewhere else, they're better than when they came to me. 
they're more knowledgeable, they're more skilled. They've learned something while they were with me. They've grown, they've developed. As a leader, that's part of my responsibility to coach and grow and develop. So th those are some of the things that actually help with employee engagement. And when you think about employee engagement, there's also employee disengagement. Like you were mentioning uh, the person who said, well, what if I train them and, 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 I, and they leave? What if you don't train them and they stay? And then they're so bad at their job that they're unhappy, but they stay and now they're disengaged, which means they're not adding any value when it comes to suggestions for improvement. There's no innovation. There's no creativity to their day. So they're just stifled. I can actually quantify that for my clients and let them know how much they're losing in terms of profit and revenue with these disengaged employees. And it's definitely more than any training you would invest in. Yeah. And usually if you're not taking care of these employees and furthering their growth, that's, that's a big issue because a lot of times that will hurt your culture because now your mm -hmm. culture is stagnant. It's not growing, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I mean, the industry I came from, there was a lot of stagnation, you know, owners that didn't want to invest in it. They didn't want to move forward. They, you know, they, they were just happy with where they were. Mm -hmm. We're making mm -hmm. money. We're not really growing. We're not going anywhere. But the other thing I want to talk about is you were, you're talking about mis mistakes and errors and stuff like that, right? Mm -hmm. I've worked quite a few places where when something goes wrong, they want to wipe it under the carpet and tell nobody. They want to keep it so quiet mm -hmm. that nobody knows anything about it. Mm -hmm. And I've always thought that this is 100% wrong. Mm -hmm. And I've always argued with, you know, ownership groups and stuff like that when, when I worked under an ownership group, right? And tell them, hey, you know, really what we should do is gather everybody in the company and tell people this is what went wrong mm -hmm. so that this never happens again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Sure, it was a mistake. Sure, it cost us, let's call it $5,000 in damages. But by you not telling everybody what happened allows that mistake to still happen again. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. right instead if you actually gathered everybody up showed them hey this is where it went wrong this is what happened here's the whole story we don't want this to happen again mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. so we want to make sure you guys are all educated but this goes back also to the training which we were talking about so if exactly. you're exactly you're educating people on the mistakes now if you bring that person out and shame them in front of everybody you know you screwed up and you cut <laughs> but you, it can be presented in such a way saying hey this mistake was made by one of the team members but we want to make sure that everybody's aware of this mistake because we don't want anyone to make it again and this is mm -hmm. an investment in training for the future so that we can hopefully grow as a team now if it's presented exactly. in that way it sounds a little bit more better still sucks that it cost a bunch of money but you've educated the team as to why you don't want that to happen, right? And right. what happened and what went wrong. Right. And now that becomes a part of your revamped training. So now you've included that into the training that you deliver so that, as you mentioned, those coming behind this, this mistake understand, you know, the impact. M mistakes occur in business. It's part of the contingency. I mean, you know, it just, it just happens. There's no way to really avoid it, but they should always be opportunities for learning and opportunities for growth. And when those mistakes do happen, we have to look at what happened, where we're lacking, where we need to change our processes or our systems. Maybe there's some um, you know, you look at your risk analysis, can you, how can you avoid that? Is there something you can put in place to make sure that doesn't happen again? And as I said, make that a part of your training. Yeah, that's that's right on the nose. That's exactly it, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because employees have to feel that they're a part of the whole scheme of things. They have to feel, as I mentioned, that their input and their presence 
mean something to the business. I don't want to just be, you know, number CJ 236A <laughs> hmm. that comes and sits in seat 15. Yeah, I want to be I want to be somebody that you're looking at as a leader. Look at me and see where you can help me grow. Of course, our coaching and development and and sometimes um, leaders only have like coaching or something like that, maybe once a year or something. I think that should be ongoing. I think you should have what I call drive-bys where you come by a desk and just, you know, maybe hang out there for a minute and you know, just see how things are going. Um, you know, are you, how's the new system working out for you? How's that, that new, um, product, you know, are, are you getting any complaints from the customers? How's things going, you know, and just kind of chat with your employees and gather information on an ongoing basis, as opposed to a scheduled time slot that you talk robotically to them, get to know your your employees, and then you can see what growth they need. And then you can also see their potential so that you can start talking to them about, hey, Beth, you know, over in accounting, um, I think there's going to be some slots opening. And I've noticed that you're really good at this, that, and other, you know, have you ever thought about that? Or, you know, would, you know, and then start getting them the training that they need to grow to that. Just talk to your employees and see where they want to go in the company, what they want to do. Their personal development is important as well. So those are just things that make employees happier. Just just to feel a part of the whole scheme and, and I'm not just, you know, something here to to drive this wheel or to, you know, drive this cog. Yeah, no, you definitely want to keep your ear to the ground, I guess, is, mm-hmm. you know. Or, you know, keep your uh, your hand on the pulse of what's going on within your company. And mm-hmm. there's a lot of people that won't. They just say, you know, no news is good news, right? Mm-hmm. And, I mean, the way I look at it, like with my customers, if they contact me saying there's a challenge, I typically want to, I, I will reach out to them again to say, hey, uh, did you solve that? And I'll reach out to them again. Hey, did you solve it? If I didn't hear anything from them, some people get back to me like a month later. Oh, sorry, I got busy. Oh, yeah, mm-hmm. I fixed it right? It's like, oh, okay. Some mm-hmm, people just mm-hmm. aren't super responsive, but that's just more like customers, right? Everybody's different. They don't see things as priorities, right? But right. if you don't prioritize talking to your team, you're not going to have your, you know, your ear to the ground of what's going on firsthand. If people are coming in saying this product is garbage and they're not happy with it, but yet your purchasing department keeps ordering it in and saying, this is what you have to sell, mm-hmm. you know, well, mm-hmm. that might be an important thing because a lot of people they think that, you know, because you're selling a, I don't know, an Android device, and if people are, you know, because it's an Android device, that it's not a big deal because people are just not going to be happy with Samsung or they're not going to be happy with Apple or whoever, right? But really, every single time you make a sale, you're hurting your own brand if you're selling garbage. Yes. And yes. that's what people forget. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And employees know this. Employees know this. Employees that your frontline employees that are taking those calls and, you know, at the front desk or whatever, those frontline employees, they know what the customers aren't happy about. You may not know as a leader, but if you're talking to your people and allowing them access to you and letting them feel that they can talk to you, they'll tell you. They'll tell you, they'll say, you know, this is a great phone, but I hear a lot of people say the the (sighs) fingerprint part doesn't work, or I hear a lot of people say that it doesn't connect well in this part of the room or, you know, just whatever it may be, your employees know. And some of that may not never get to you if you're not talking to your employees. Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. So, Mm -hmm. um, Let's let's hop into a another question here. What what methods do you use to improve productivity? Well, I have several tools at my disposal. One is that I will perform a detailed process review 
to look at your processes and see if I can spot any opportunities for improvement. Maybe someplace where you're really slowing down. Uh, I'll look at your customer experience. I'll actually map out your customer journey to see how easy it is for your customer to do business with you. How easy is it for them once they come in the door to find the product that they want to make returns, billing, ordering, how that process is going. So I'll just kind of come in and look at your, you know, how, how you're doing business to see if there's anywhere that I can improve. If you've got redundant processes or like we were saying before, if there's areas where your employees have to stop what they're doing to come to you or to send out a request to get part of this issue managed. Those are things that I look at uh, helping you improve. But I also look at the team dynamics. I look to see how your team is working together. So I'll assess your team and see the different personalities and the different opportunities that they take. Do they help each other? Do they hear one struggling with an issue and say, hey, you know, I had that yesterday. Let me show you how to handle that. Or are they all working in little silos? Do they trust each other? Are they open to discussing their concerns in your meetings and on your calls? Or is everybody holding back their own little, because there's no trust or there's no feeling of inclusion or belonging? Are they do they do they respect each other's opinions and things like that? So I, I actually have a product that I uh, sometimes offer. It's called uh, DISC, Everything DISC. It's a personality assessment. You may have heard of it. And unlike most personality assessments that just kind of tell the participant about them, oh, you're an aggressive person, oh, you this, you detailed, you're that. This will actually tell you about other people on your team and how you can work better with them. For instance, if you and I were on a team, Ben, and we both took the DISC assessment, DISC might let me know that Ben likes to get information at a high level. He doesn't like a bunch of detail and bits and pieces. So when you're communicating with Ben, give him the top line and let him know what he needs to do. However, Beverly, Ben, likes to get details. She likes to know the ins and outs and everything, how everything is put together, how everything comes together. So when you come to her with information, you're going to need to have a complete package. And there's just lots of other things that this can tell you about your peers and your leaders and tell your leaders about the employees. So I, I utilize that product often to help me understand how the team actually works together and how the leader is leading the team. And that will help me spot opportunities as well. Yeah, I was actually, I had to refresh my mind. I had to go take a look at it online here, discprofile.com mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and uh, just take a look at it again. It's probably been a while since I've used this, but I, I but I know uh, it also was linking Tony Robbins <laughs> to uh, someone who also uses it quite a bit, I guess. So, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that's, uh, that's, I, I don't think, I don't think I've used that since like the Best Buy days, I want to say right now, which is quite a few years ago now. Yeah. It's used in over 70 some countries. And uh, I mean, you know, there's a, there's a lot of a rave about DISC simply because like I mentioned, how it kind of separates other uh, separates itself from other personality profiles because it doesn't just tell you about you or it doesn't just give you insight to you it gives you insight into your team nice just very yeah very valuable well we're kind of coming to the end here so i'm kind of wondering how do our listeners get a hold of you is well that's thank you for asking i'm everywhere <laughs> i'm on I'm on Facebook, um, I'm on Twitter, Strategic HR Consultants. You can reach me via my website, which is customermeasures.com. There's a contact me link there. There's also uh, my Calendly where you can schedule a consultation with me. I offer a 60, to your viewers, I'll be offering a 60 minute consultation. There's also my email, which is Beverly 
at customermeasures.com. Or you can just pick up the phone the old-fashioned way and give me a call. You can reach me at 888-272-7711. You can also find me on LinkedIn, Beverly Hathorne on LinkedIn. My company's on LinkedIn, Strategic HR Consultants. It's right here, right on the website. You know? Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> I, you know what? I, I, someone recommended me yesterday to do business with this such and such company. Mm-hmm. No phone number on their entire website. So I finally found a number via searching Google, called them, and went mm-hmm. to the owner of the company. And you know what it said? This voicemail is full. It's full. You can't leave a message. Mm-hmm. And all I was thinking was, I won't do business with this company. I don't care how good they are, I don't care that they were referred from a friend. If their voicemail is full and they're not getting mm-hmm. back to people, I ain't doing business with them. I don't care if they're the best in the city. Well, yes, that that is unfortunate. And that's not a great way of doing business. <laughs> that's not a person who has any type of customer service background would be my my thinking. Yeah. My goal is to make it mm-hmm. as easy as possible to reach me me so yeah my phone number is right there on the top of the website and um you will not run into that problem i have an entire team answering our call so that's awesome yeah that's (laughs) wicked and you know what's funny i actually bought a wallet recently uh about about a month and a half ago now and i told them hey listen i just want to tell you about my customer experience and i told these people because they were a local company and i was floored that it was a local company who was building building wallets So there's no phone number on your website anywhere. It made me feel uncomfortable. I didn't even know where the product Mm -hmm. was coming from. Mm -hmm, So I mm -hmm. gave them all this like feedback and they emailed me back saying no one's ever taken the time to give us feedback like that before. And they actually went and added the number to the website. They went Mm -hmm. and did a whole bunch of changes to the website very quickly. I even said where it says you can email you, you actually put it in like this gray font, which blends Mm -hmm. it with the background. You can't see it. (laughs) <laughs> and they're like, we didn't even realize it was like that bad because we're not website designers, right? We're we're engineers. We we you know we build this cool wallet. We did this, so mm-hmm. a lot of these companies sometimes don't even realize it unless you say something, right? And for me, I think it's big that you have your phone number there and that you can easily see it because I'm looking at the website right now and easily mm-hmm. get a hold of you. And so you know you can tell that you're somebody who has come from a customer service background because you want to make it. The KISS theory, keep it simple, stupid. Make it very easy for people (laughs) to get a hold of you. That's exactly it, right? Exactly right. Thank you so much for that. And also my uh, Facebook and Twitter and all those handles are are on that page. Also, they're at the bottom of every page. So you can just click there and, and, and get to me there. There's lots of ways to get in touch with me. So there you go. Have a problem. Beverly, mm-hmm. customermeasures.com. Thank you, Beverly. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much, Ben. I really enjoyed this chat. Thank you. <laughs>